Right, good, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Brian Lawson. Uh, I'm the, the technical and quality director for uh, Project Solutions Limited. Um, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the fifth IMECI STEAM lecture. Uh, it's the fifth in a series of eight. Um, it's hosted by Project Solutions, so I'd like to thank uh, the MD for uh, allowing us to do this. Uh, project Solutions are a, um, a project engineering and, and management services uh, company based in West Yorkshire. We've also got a, an office up in the Wilton in Teesside, um, and our details are on the screen there. If you want any further information, track us down on LinkedIn. I'm sure we'll be able to help. Um, the uh, the presentation, the, the lectures uh, is uh, kindly provided by uh, Dan Wells from Spirax Sarko. Um, and he does a, a sterling job, excellent feedback in previous ones. Um, we'll be videoing the, uh, the, the lecture. Um, and once it's videoed, uh, we do, after a couple of days, we'll upload it to the Project Solutions uh, YouTube channel. Um, and uh, Nikki uh, will, uh, from the IMEC -E, will send a link out to everybody that um, uh, that registered, so you'll be able to watch it. And so anybody that misses the, the lecture tonight will be able to catch up. Uh, with questions, I've seen there's something happening on the chat now, but uh, with, uh, with questions, we'll take them at the end if that's okay. Uh, and the easiest way to do that logistically is just bang them into the chat and we'll take them one at a time uh, at the end. Um, and we'll take it from there, I think. So without further ado, uh, big build up for, for Dan. Uh, take it away, buddy. It's all yours. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Brian. And thank you also to yourself and your colleagues at Projects and also your fellow members at IMEC for facilitating this evening's presentation. Um, so tonight's presentation is number five of a suite of CPD presentations that we've put together in partnership with Projects and uh, the IMEC. Previously, we've presented on the very, very broad introduction to STEAM system fundamentals and the basic principles. We moved on. We spoke about how it's important to convey STEAM from the point of generation to the point of use in accordance with good working practice. We moved on to look at why it's so attractive for STEAM to be used as a source of heat exchange. The last time we met, two weeks ago, we spoke about steam trapping. So as we've mentioned today, we're going to move forward and we're going to look at the specific topic of how we manage that liquid condensate. So the good news is for those of you that have attended previous presentations, we'll have a very, very basic reminder of some of the basic principles. But for any of you that are joining us for the first time, don't worry, you won't be left behind. I have given an introduction to Spirax Sarko previously. Um, I won't bore you with too many of the details. The reason I've put the slide up is really to remind you of that very, very useful app that we have. And I'd encourage you to download our, our free of charge app to your smartphone, whether it be an Android or, or a, a, an iPhone. Please download it. it. You'll find it very, very useful. Uh, it's got a powerful suite of configurators and calculators. If you are going to download it, make sure it's the Spirax Sarko Mexico version, not the UK and Republic of Ireland version. The Mexican version's got a lot more functionality on it, and you can also change the language back to uh, back to English again. So why would we uh, why would we bother to reinvent the wheel? So uh, moving on, the topic of today's presentation, as you can see, it's on the subject of condensate. And what you may remember from previous presentations is that condensate is the byproduct of steam when steam gives up its heat energy. The steam as a gas, as a vapor, changes state to condensate as a liquid. And as we go through the presentation, it'll probably become clear 
why it's the condensate side of the loop, the wet side, that so often causes problems for many mechanical engineers, especially those who may be more experienced with liquid systems. So we're going to go through the presentation tonight to fully understand what condensate actually is, how we need to treat it completely differently to, to water, and we're going to understand the, both the problems that it can pose to a process and also the benefits that we can have if we can find some way to reuse that liquid, uh, that liquid condensate somewhere else in the process. So the slide that I'm showing at the moment, for those of you that have attended previous CPD presentations, it should be no stranger to you. Uh, so I apologize for going through this slide again, but it is critically important that we fully understand what steam is, because it's only that way that we can appreciate uh, the benefits and the challenges that condensate can pose. So do you remember that magic number that we've spoken about previously? 4.19 that's the specific heat capacity of, of water and we know that water is the raw ingredient of the steam system 4.19 that means if we want to increase one kilogram of water by just one degree we need to add 4.19 kilojoules of energy to it so to bring water up to boiling point which atmospheric conditions, zero bar gauge, we know is 100 degrees, that boiling water needs to contain 419 kilojoules of energy. We can call that the enthalpy of water. We can also call it the sensible heat. But if we actually want steam rather than boiling water, we need to add more energy to it, 2,257 kilojoules of energy. We call that the enthalpy of evaporation, we can also call it the latent heat. So when, one, when that one kilogram of water has fully boiled dry, we've now got a volume of steam. And at atmospheric conditions, that volume of steam will exist at 1.673 cubic meters per kilogram. So when you consider that a kilogram of water has got a volume of 0 0.001, you can appreciate that that change of state has brought around an expansion to a factor of 1,673 times. And that kilogram of gas is going to have an energy content that is 2,676 kilojoules. In other words, it's the sensible heat plus the latent heat. That gives us the total heat. So the steam tables, it shows us the energy content and the physical properties in accordance with the pressure that the steam is being generated at. Now, the other thing that the steam tables show us is if we focus on the three columns that we can see here, the enthalpy columns, when steam gives up its heat energy, it condenses. It changes state from a gas to a liquid. So it's actually the enthalpy of evaporation that's the useful heat energy that moves across the heat transfer surface area. That's the heat energy that is therefore added to the process. The sensible heat, that's trapped in the condensate. The condensate cannot give up that heat energy to the process. And you'll notice that the energy that is shown in the water is representative of the temperature and the pressure at boiling point, and it's the same energy content that exists in the condensate after the steam has given up its heat energy. So moving across to the uh, the temperature enthalpy curve that we can see towards the, the right hand side of the screen, well this really demonstrates the journey that water takes as it changes state from a liquid to steam, a gas. So you can see by using the example of zero bar gauge where water boils at 100, once we've added 419 kilojoules of energy into that water, at atmospheric conditions, we've hit boiling point. That's when the steam is going to start to be produced as the water evaporates. But it's only once we've added the full 
enthalpy of evaporation or latent heat to it, that we can say that that water has fully evaporated. So we've now got 100% dry saturated steam. Now, in previous weeks, we've mentioned how dry saturated steam is critically important because if we're not producing dry saturated steam, we're likely to have steam that sits slightly to the left of the dry saturated steam line in the wet steam zone. Now, wet steam is problematic for processors for the first reason that wet steam is far more likely to condense out and give up its heat energy to the distribution pipe work itself. And that can be hundreds, if not thousands of meters in length. So if we're distributing steam that's significantly wet, a reasonable proportion of that steam is going to be lost to condensate even before it gets to the process. So we can have a significant inefficiency as a result of producing wet steam. We also know that wet steam, it can create corrosion. We also know that wet steam can cre create erosion, abrasion of sensitive areas, especially if we're conveying that steam very, very quickly. We know if we've got an excess of condensate as a result of that steam being wet, we've got to install more steam traps to remove it. We know we're at greater risk of exposure to water hammer if we've got excessively wet steam because we've got more condensate in the network. But we also know that the steam that does eventually find its way being conveyed to the process because it's wet, it's going to have significantly less heat energy contained within it. So when steam's being used to heat a process, remember, it's that enthalpy of evaporation. It's that latent heat. It's the energy that we add to that boiling water to make it change state to steam. It's that energy that passes from the primary side into the secondary side, into the process itself. And we can only actually use this latent heat. And that's approximately 75% of the total heat energy. We can only use that latent heat for heat exchange purposes. So that means that we can't use the energy that's, that remains. We can't use that sensible heat. We can't use that remaining 25% of the total heat energy for heat transfer purposes. There's simply not enough of it. But remember, because steam's got that direct pressure to temperature relationship that we've spoken about previously, so too does the condensate. For example, if we're generating steam at a pressure of 10 bar gauge, the steam tables, they tell us that at 10 bar gauge, the temperature, the boiling point of water is 184 degrees. Therefore, the temperature of the steam is 184 degrees. Well, that condensate that exists in the distribution pipe work at 10 bar gauge, it's also going to sit there as a liquid at 184 degrees. It can exist at that high temperature because of the pressure. So if we've, re if we've reduced the pressure of the steam at the process, let's say we've reduced it down to two bar gauge because that's what's required by the process. At two bar gauge, the temperature of steam 132 degrees. Therefore, the temperature of the condensate that needs to be removed from the process is also going to be 132 degrees. If we reduce the pressure of the steam, we manipulate its temperature. The same applies to the condensate. But remember, the condensate will exist at the same temperature as the steam. It'll just have far, far less energy contained within it. So just to remind ourselves, if we put one kilogram of water or one liter of water into the boiler, it's going to evaporate and it's going to produce one kilogram of steam. But um, using 10 bar gauge as an example, the volume of that one kilogram of steam will now have grown to be 1.673 cubic meters or 1,673 times greater. And we know that steam gives up its heat to the process by condensing. So we can calculate both the amount of heat that the process needs, the mass of steam, and therefore we've got an understanding with regards to the mass of condensate that we also need to remove. 
So, in other words, if we've got one kilogram of steam being produced in the boiler, then we know we're distributing one kilogram of steam towards the process, minus a few distribution losses. That also tells us that we therefore need to remove one kilogram of condensate from the process. The mass flow remains the same. It's the volumetric flow that differs as we get that change of state. So we know that condensate is a liquid. We know it's formed wherever steam gives up its latent heat energy, wherever there's a heat loss. And that can take part in two different areas of the, of the steam distribution network. So first of all, we know that we distribute steam at a high pressure for the benefits that we've spoken about previously. At a higher pressure, the steam is likely to be drier. The steam boiler is far, far smaller in footprint. It will operate more efficiently. We're gonna have more energy in the steam. And of course, most importantly, that distribution network will be very, very small in size because we've squeezed that volume down under a high pressure. But because we're distributing steam at a high pressure, it exists at a high temperature. So when we're distributing that steam in steel pipes, especially over a considerable distance, it's inevitable it, we're going to have some heat loss in the network and the steam is going to give up its energy to the pipe work and that's where the condensate is going to exist. And there are a number of different factors that can influence how much condensate is actually produced. That could be down to, is the steam wet or dry? Have we sized the pipe works correctly? What's the pressure? What's the temperature? What are the ambient conditions? How, is the pipe work running indoors or outdoors? Is it insulated or not? All of these factors can tell us how much steam condenses and therefore we can understand what the distribution loss is. Now we can use the calculators and configurators to arrive at that amount, but typically speaking, we use a rule of thumb that tells us that approximately 2% of the mass of steam that is being distributed is going to be lost as a result of a heat loss. So for example, if we're distributing a mass flow of 10,000 kilograms per hour of steam around the network, well, we know that we expect a heat loss of approximately 200 kilograms or 2%. But what you'll remember from last week is that we always double that amount because we expect far, far more heat loss under the first few hours when the steam system is being warmed up. So we always double that 2% running load to allow for what we call the warming up load. In other words, 4%. So that information is critically important when it comes to helping us understand how we size and select the steam traps to ensure that we can drain that condensate away and ensure that the steam is kept as dry as it possibly can. And then, of course, the remainder of the condensate is going to exist at the process, at the heat exchangers. And that's a good thing because that tells us that that's where the steam is giving up its energy and doing its job. So the remaining 96 to 98% of the steam, that's going to condense at the process. But remember, because we distribute steam at a high pressure, we know that the steam is going to exist at a high temperature and the condensate will also exist at a high temperature at this point. Whereas at the process, well, we'll have reduced the pressure of the steam. So we're going to have a significantly greater mass of condensate to remove. It's just going to exist at a lower temperature and at a lower pressure. So you can appreciate that one of the first questions that any of our engineers will ask if you seek them guidance on a, an existing steam distribution network is when we're talking about condensate, what is the pressure? What is the temperature? and whereabouts on the, on the steam and condensate network are we addressing this issue? So uh, we've also mentioned insulation and that can have a huge Im impact on condensate load. And that's because of the mass of metal that's involved with any flanges, 
strainers, separators, trap sets, valves, any other ancillaries. We need to ensure that we've got the best possible grade of insulation to protect that mass of metal, because that's where we expect a significant amount of heat loss to take place. So again, we've got calculators and configurators that can help you understand the importance of ensuring that we keep that grade of insulation as high as possible. So for example, if we tweak the insulation and improve its quality, we'll be reducing the heat loss. And if we're reducing the heat loss, then we've got a far, far greater energy efficiency cost saving. We're getting more steam distributed to the process. And if we're getting less heat loss, we've got less condensate to remove. We need fewer steam traps to install and maintain. If we've got drier steam, we expect to see less corrosion, less erosion, less water hammer, and we're ultimately going to have more and more heat energy in the steam to ensure the process can take place far more efficiently. So it's always a good idea to ensure that we've got the best condition of uh, uh, insulation that we can, uh, we can expect. So as we've mentioned already, steam gives up its latent heat energy by condensing. So above you can see what we refer to as a closed loop system. And that's when steam goes onto a heat exchanger and the condensate, which is full of that sensible heat that we can't use at the process, it's got no value to us. It's high temperature hot water, but it simply doesn't have enough energy in it. We've got to drain it away. And it bears mentioning that steam can be used for direct injection processes, commonly used in food, beverage, pharmaceutical, healthcare sector, for example. But if we're using steam for direct injection processes, then that steam and also the condensate itself, that becomes absorbed into the atmosphere. For example, if we're using steam for humidification, there isn't any condensate to remove because it becomes part of the atmosphere. So under these circumstances, it's the latent heat and the sensible heat that go into the process. But for the vast majority of applications, we look at removing condensate from typical closed loop systems. So many of the heat exchanger examples that we looked at in one of our previous topics, examples of typical closed loop systems or heat exchangers, well, they could be jacketed vessels or boiling pans. They could be shell and tube heat exchangers or, or they could be plate heat exchangers. And what you'll remember from that previous presentation is because condensate as a liquid has got far, far less heat energy contained within it compared to steam, we need to get that liquid condensate away quickly. If we don't do that, that condensate is likely to back up and flood that heat transfer surface area that we need to be full of steam, to have a high energy content to keep the process satisfied. So I just wanna come back to the steam table slide that we looked at previously. We know that when steam gives up its latent heat, its useful heat, we know it condenses. And we know that the condensate retains its, its sensible heat, which is approximately 25% of the total. So for example, if we're looking at condensate at a uh, two bar gauge, for example, we know the temperature of the condensate is going to be 134 degrees. We know the energy that is present within the condensate is going to be 562 kilojoules. So we can see that that condensate, it's hot water. There isn't enough heat energy contained within it to satisfy the process but there's still a lot of energy contained within it that we can use elsewhere. One of the reasons why we want to recover the condensate and get it back to the boiler house. And we also know that there's that direct pressure to temperature relationship that exists both with steam and with that liquid condensate. We control the pressure, we manipulate the temperature. So um, just so we're clear, if, we've, if we're distributing steam at a high pressure, and a high temperature, the condensate will exist at that high temperature too. We reduce the pressure of the steam at the process, the condensate will also fall in pressure and fall in temperature. 
But um, the point that I really want to make here is if we're distributing steam that is very, very wet to the process, we've gone to an extreme down here. And the extreme is that that steam could have a dryness fraction of 0.5. In other words, it's 50% steam and it's 50% entrained moisture. A little bit extreme, but, but bear with me. That means that if we've got a dryness value of 50%, it means it's going to have 50% of the energy contained within it. So, of course, that means that the process is likely to extend and extend and extend, or it could well be that the heat exchanger is calling for an increased mass of steam. And assuming that there's enough energy, enough steam in the network to provide that shortfall, then it means we'll be condensing more and more steam. So it means that we need to size the infrastructure behind the heat exchanger to accommodate that increased mass of condensate. And as, uh, as the little blue banner mentions, a higher steam consumption is gonna equal the fact that we need to remove a greater mass of condensate. We often come across issues in certain plant rooms where our clients may have introduced a new heat exchanger or they may have introduced a new process that's consuming steam. And they won't necessarily have thought about how they get rid of that byproduct, the condensate. Bring a new process online, yep, we've got plenty of steam. They'll tie into the existing network. They'll put another heat exchanger in the plant room, but they won't think about how they need to get rid of that condensate and how an excess of condensate that backs up can impact on the process. A greater steam consumption will equal a greater mass of condensate that needs to be removed. So a common question that we often get asked by our clients is, they appreciate that condensate doesn't have any value at the process. When we're talking about condensate at the process, it's a bad thing. Processing the uh, condensate in the distribution network is also a bad thing. We need to get that condensate away because it doesn't have enough heat energy contained within it, but it's still hot water. And we understand that the one area where we can make good use of that condensate is by getting it back to the hot well, getting it back to the atmospheric deaerator. If you remember, the more hot condensate we can recover, the more quickly the boiler will respond to produce steam whenever there's a demand, the more rapidly it'll react to produce that steam. It means we're getting less thermal shock if we're putting hot water into the boiler cavity rather than much colder water. But it also means we need to add far, far fewer chemicals into the feed tank, because if we've got if we've got feed water that's held there at a nice high temperature, we need to add fewer conditioning chemicals to purge off the air and the non-condensable gases. So a client's on board with recovering the condensate. But typically they'll ask us, well, how much condensate am I actually recovering? And it's... Um, it, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough one to answer, really, because it really depends upon um, how they're using the steam in the various processes, as I'll come on and explain in the next slide. But the good news is that our clients can actually very, very easily monitor their condensate recovery rate. And if they're monitoring and testing their boiler in accordance with BGO1 guidance, they'll have a daily log book where they're monitoring the water quality in various points. For example, if we're monitoring the condition of the water in the condensate that's being returned, if we're monitoring the condition of the water that's coming from the mains that are making up those losses, and if we're monitoring the quality of the combination of the two in the feed water, well, we can, we can run a very, very simple calculation to get a ratio of the condensate that is actually being returned from the various processes around the site. And we can do that by conductivity. We can simply take a sample of the water, we can neutralize it for pH, cool it down to 25 degrees, run a conductivity probe across it, 
we multiply the conductivity by 0.7 and that tells us the total dissolved solid content of that water in parts per million. So it means that we can get an understanding for the percentage of condensate that is being returned. For example, if we're generating 10,000 kilograms per hour of steam, it will tell us if we're returning 85%, it tells us that if we've got a ratio of 85%, it tells us we're recovering approximately 8,500 kilograms of condensate per hour. The reason being, condensate has already been chemically treated and condensate is in an excellent condition for going straight back into the boiler without the addition of any further uh, water treatment chemicals. The less condensate we're recovering, the more makeup water we need. And the more makeup water we need, the greater the amount of chemicals we need to add to condition it. So once we're able to educate our clients or once our clients have run the analysis themselves to understand how much condensate they are recovering, the next question is, well, what does good look like? How much condensate should I actually aim to be recovering? And that's a difficult one to answer because every process, every site, they're completely different. Remember those open steam systems, the direct injection systems. If we've got a client that's got a lot of direct injection processes, a lot of humidification, well, then a lot of condensate is going to be absorbed into the process or, or into the atmosphere. So the return level, the amount of condensate we can expect to get back is it's going to be quite low. But if we've only got closed loop systems, heat exchangers, then a good rule of thumb to aim for is we should be looking to get back uh, approximately 80% of all of the condensate that is being generated. 100% return rate is completely unrealistic because it's, it's likely that we may have the occasional leaking joint. It's likely that we could have the occasional steam trap that's failed in the open position and therefore venting steam to atmosphere. And it's likely we could have a little bit of flash steam venting away. Remember, if we're losing steam, then we're losing the opportunity to recover that condensate. But if we can at least be aware of the true percentage that we are returning, it means we can identify where and when energy efficiency opportunities can exist. For example, if, um, if we look at the temperature gauge, that's sat on the side of the boiler feed tank, the hot well. Remember that rule of thumb. For every six degrees, we can increase the temperature of the feed water by. We expect to enjoy a cost saving of 1% by reducing the fuel demand. And if we do find that we've got a temperature gauge that is hanging at quite a low point, 60 degrees or less, then it tells us we've got condensate going missing. And it gives us the opportunity to walk the plant and identify where those energy saving opportunities may be. So the point that separates the steam distribution network from the condensate return line is the steam trap itself. And the last time we met, we discussed correct sizing and selection criteria for good working practice with steam traps. What we should remember is that we need to ensure that when we're venting air at the same time that we're passing condensate, and we need to ensure that we've sized and select the correct type of steam trap for each individual process. So there are a number of different considerations to take on board. It really depends upon the nature of the process. It's not just how much condensate we're passing as a mass flow, it's also uh, whether there's likely to be air present in the steam and condensate that needs to be vented away, whether it's going to be exposed to water hammer, vibration, freezing, the mass flow rate of condensate, the pressure of condensate, and, and so forth and so forth. All of these things need to be taken into consideration. And of course, we need to ensure that the steam trap itself is being adequately audited and monitored. If the steam trap fails, then of course, we're going to get issues, not just with the process, but also with the condensate return line. So I wanna move on to an area that um, catches a lot of mechanical engineers out. 
And we've got a typical process that we can look at here. It's a jacketed vessel, but it could very easily be any other heat exchanger. So you can see on this occasion, uh, the process is calling for the steam to be supplied at a temperature of 170 degrees. And at 170 degrees, the steam tables tell us that the pressure required is seven bar gauge. So we know that when that steam condenses, it changes state to a liquid. We also know that the liquid is going to exist at the same temperature and at the same pressure as the steam. So where we've got this downward pointing arrow here, pointing to the condensate line that connects the process to the trap, what we have here at this point is condensate as a liquid. So what we need to do is size the condensate pipework here to accommodate that 100 kilogram per hour mass flow. Um, because the condensate is actually under pressure at this point here, remember it exists at a pressure of seven bar gauge, but because it's under pressure, it can exist as a liquid at 170 degrees. Either way, because the condensate is a liquid, it helps us to understand that we only need to size the distribution pipework at this point as a liquid. So as long as we can accommodate the mass flow rate of condensate that needs to be removed, we've sized the pipework correctly. And as we mentioned previously, the amount of steam that's being condensed equals the amount of condensate that needs to be removed, 100 kilograms. But it's good work in practice to ensure that we've got enough resilience to remove the additional mass of condensate that will be produced when the network's warming up. So the 100 kilograms per hour, that's what we refer to as the running load. It's good work in practice at processors to multiply the amount of condensate that will need to be removed under those first couple of hours by two, better still three. We call that the warming up load. So what the little chart towards the right hand side of the screen demonstrates is, yes, we can size condensate pipe work at this point as a liquid. We simply take the mass flow rate of condensate. In other words, it's the steam condensing rate multiplied by that safety factor of three. Using a water pipe sizing chart, we take the line horizontally across and you can see we're probably gonna size using a 15 mil pipe to remove that liquid condensate. Now, this is the part that starts to catch a lot of engineers out, and it's what happens downstream of the steam trap. So what you remember is upstream of the steam trap, the condensate is under pressure. In our example, it's at seven bar gauge. 170 degrees. And if we refer to the steam tables or that useful little app, you'll remember that the sensible heat that exists in the condensate at seven bar gauge is 721 kilojoules. Remember, seven bar gauge, 170 degrees. Multiply that 170 degrees by the magic number 4.19, we get 721 kilojoules. And what you remember from the presentation we went through two weeks ago is that we need a pressure drop across the trap. We need to use the steam pressure to push the condensate away. So that pressure drop is a good thing because it ensures that we've got motive energy in the condensate. But the problem that causes is if we get a falling pressure behind the trap, the example we've got here, again, it's, it's an extreme, we've got a pressure drop down to atmospheric zero bar gauge and at atmospheric conditions zero bar gauge we know that the condensate can exist at 100 degrees 100 multiplied by that 4.19 magic number it tells us that the sensible heat in the condensate is going to be 419. in other words in that very very short distance that liquid condensate has got to give up 302 kilojoules in other words, that heat energy in the condensate, some of it, a certain percentage of it, has got to change from sensible heat to total heat. 
And the only way it can do that is by having a partial phase change. We're releasing or we're changing state from liquid condensate back to flash steam again. The condensate is producing steam for no other reason than a pressure drop. You might think, so what? Well, remember that at atmospheric conditions, steam's got a volume that's approximately 1,673 times greater than condensate as a liquid. So if you look at the little image here, it's just to, to remind us that if we take a typical cross-sectional area of a pipe that's downstream of a steam trap, we need to allow for that phase change, that flash steam to be produced. If we don't, we're going to get a lot of problems. First problem is that expanding steam that's going to take place very quickly is going to create a back pressure on the steam trap. The condensate isn't going to be able to pass away from the trap. We might get a little bit of damage to the trap. The condensate is going to back up and flood the process. That's going to have an effect on process efficiency, process quality, process productivity. We're pressurizing the condensate line with that expansion of flash steam. That's going to create a violent knocking, banging, damage, water hammer to the condensate network. That bubble of flash steam is going to pass to, to an area where it can be safely vented away. Now that could be a condensate receiver, it could be a flash steam vent, or it could mean that that bubble of steam is pushed all the way back to the boiler house. And of course, if we've got a huge mass of steam arriving in the hot well, it can cause problems to the hot well itself. In all likelihood, it's going to get vented away, but it's representative of a, a huge loss of energy. So over towards the right hand side of the screen, that shows us that we now need to size a condensate pipe work, allowing for that expansion as a result of the phase change. So the bottom part of the graph you can see here, first of all, we find the pressure drop, seven bar gauge to zero bar gauge on this occasion. The red dotted line, we move vertically upwards to select the mass flow rate. 100 kilograms per hour. We take the dotted line and we run the line up diagonally. And you can see on this occasion, we can size somewhere between a 25 and 20 mil pipe, depending upon whether the pipe is, is rising or falling. But it really demonstrates that the trap that a lot of engineers fall into is they assume that condensates are liquid and they'd want to size this pipe work as such and if they ran the line across horizontally, they'd be in danger of grossly undersizing that pipework system. So please, whenever you think about condensate, think of it as a biphase. Condensate should only ever be considered when it's at a stable pressure. As soon as there's a fall in pressure, there will be a phase change, and it's that expansion that will catch us out. So again, on the point of good working practice, um, yes, we can bring multiple condensate legs together into one common discharge line, providing we've allowed for the step up in mass flow and also for the step up of any volumetric flow as a result of that flash steam that will be produced. So that little formula that's shown towards the bottom right of the screen, it's really just to remind me to, to, to tell you to take that into consideration. You can, of course, use that app that we have. So I want to talk about another concept, and that's what we refer to as stall. So we've mentioned that heat exchangers cannot use the energy in the condensate. It can cause a problem if it backs up and floods the heat exchanger. We've also mentioned that we need a positive pressure drop across the steam trap. We need to use the steam pressure to push that condensate away. But in the heat exchanger presentation we went through before Christmas, we also mentioned that it's more efficient if we can condense the steam at the lowest possible pressure. So it could well be that we're condensing the steam at, let's say, one bar gauge pressure. But if there's a two bar gauge differential pressure posed by the condensate pipework return network, then there simply isn't going to be enough motive energy to move the condensate away from the heat exchanger and across the trap. And when that happens, 
we're at risk that that condensate can back up and flood the network. Remember, there's not enough heat energy in the condensate. So that's when the process time will extend until it stalls altogether. And stall can create a whole range of problems from a failure of the control valve itself, a failure to the heat exchanger. But ultimately, it means that we're going to have huge problems with the process. Now, the good news is we can overcome a stall condition using what we call an automatic pump trap or an APT. It works in exactly the same way as a float trap does when we do have a good differential pressure. But on those occasions where that differential pressure falls, we can take a mass of high pressure steam that exists ahead of the pressure reducing valve or control valve. We add that motive energy to the condensate and we can shunt it away back where it can be reused. The good news is it guarantees that the process can run at an optimum efficiency at all times, and we can get the maximum amount of energy from the condensate back to the boiler house where it can be reused. But we also know that there are always going to be occasions where we need to add some motive energy to the condensate. We've got to pump it back to the boiler house in somewhere. And we can do that in one of two ways. We can do it using what we call an electric condensate receiver. As the name suggests, it does require uh, an electrical installation to power those little centrifugal pumps. Uh, so it's not always suitable for, for every area. Um, it also means that because we've got electrical components there, we need to ensure that the condensate can cool down to a temperature of 100 degrees or below. So we're not going to get cavitation and failure. So we've got to size the condensate receiver correctly, and we've got to size that flash steam vent correctly. The best way to cool the condensate down to 100 degrees or below is to allow it to fall to atmospheric zero bar gauge. So the risk is that, do you remember that uh, example I gave previously? If we've got a client that's increased their condensate load, maybe they've put an additional heat exchanger in the plant room. If they haven't upsized the receiver, then the condensate can no longer cool down quickly enough. The pumps are going to race against that high temperature condensate. They're going to cavitate. They're going to fail. If we've undersized the vent, or if we've had a contractor on site that's put a dog leg in the vent, the flash steam can't escape. The condensate can't cool down. Maybe we've got a couple of failed steam traps. If we've got live steam coming into this massive condensate, it won't be able to cool down. The pumps will cavitate, they'll fail, the condensate will back up and it will be dumped to waste through the overflow. So if we have identified that the temperature of the hot well is significantly lower than we'd like it to be, one of the very, very first places we want to come and look is at the condensate receiver itself. And for similar reasons, don't lag the condensate receiver. We're ensuring that the condensate cannot cool down before it can be pumped. The good news is because we've vented that flash steam away, the condensate is now 100% liquid. So we can pump that condensate the distance back to the boiler house on a much, much smaller liquid line. On the opposite side of the coin, we've got the mechanical condensate recovery pumps. And as the name suggests, we don't need any electrical installation. It, we're using the steam power. You, we're using the motive energy in the steam to shunt the condensate back. But because it works mechanically, it'll work on a, a cycle of typically 25% of the time. So it's vitally important to ensure that we're sizing the pump and the condensate discharge pipe work on the discharge capacity of the pump not on its fill capacity. So that means that the discharge pipe work can, if we compare it to an electrical condensate recovery system, the, the, the run of pipe work to pump it back can, can often be three times larger. So that cost really needs to be, to, to be factored in whenever we're benchmarking the benefits of one pump versus the next. So condensate not only contains around 25% of the total energy of steam, but it's also got a value to us because it's chemically treated water. 
So all of these elements can be can be quantified if we've already benchmarked the cost of steam to give us an understanding of the return of investment that we can expect by looking to increase the percentage of condensate that we can we can actively get back. So you can run similar cost saving calculations on on those apps that we've spoken about. But all of our engineers have got access to some very detailed software that can give you a more detailed appraisal of where energy cost saving opportunities can be if you may require further guidance. So I want to give you a very, very quick understanding now as to how we can calculate the benefits of an, an additional return of condensate. So we start off by looking at our client's cost of steam. And if we use an example where we know that gas costs three pence per kilowatt hour, if we've got a boiler that is producing steam with an efficiency of 85%, if we know the pressure of the boiler is 10 bar gauge, and if we know the temperature of the hot well is, is 85 degrees, well, we might mistakenly assume that because we've got a hot well at 85 degrees, we might believe that we've got an excellent rate of condensate return and we might not actually have thought about actually measuring the rate of return using the conductivity of those samples we might not have thought about that because the temperature could be telling us that well we're getting a lot of condensate back but it could well be that we've got a direct steam injection system on the hot well and it could well be that the temperature is held at that high point simply by taking energy from the boiler and moving it to the hot well. We're robbing Peter to pay Paul. There's, there's no overall energy efficiency gain by doing that. All we're doing is essentially quenching off the, um, the air and the other non-condensable gases. So we could actually uh, calculate the cost of steam by, first of all, we take the amount of energy that is present in the steam at that pressure, 10 bar gauge, and we minus the energy that is present in the water at 85 degrees. And if we then multiply this by the efficiency of the boiler, 85%, then we know how much gas we need to consume to, to raise the steam. And then we can multiply this by the, the cost of gas per, per kilowatt hour. But remember, if we're using that direct steam injection system to keep the feed water at 85 degrees, it could well be that we're doing that because we're simply not recovering anywhere near as much condensate as we could. We could be dumping a lot of hot condensate to waste as a result of having those pumps cavitate or having flash steam or steam traps left in the failed position. So if we've got a lot of cold condensate, sorry, hot condensate going to waste, we're consuming more cold water that we need to heat up. So Let's say we've identified that we can now recover an additional 500 kilograms per hour of condensate. Well, this means that we can not only increase the, the rate of condensate return, but we can also reduce the amount of steam that we were consuming by reducing the need for that direct steam injection. So if we can now get the condensate back to the boiler house at a temperature of 75, we know that there'll be far, far more energy in the feed water, and we need to add less direct steam injection to top it up to 85 degrees. So in the case of raising raw water from 10 degrees to 75, you can see that if we can do this by maximizing the condensate return, rather than by using direct steam injection, well, we'll be saving 59 kilograms of steam per hour, which over a year, that's going to be representative of a cost saving of a little over £12,000 sterling. But remember, it's scalable. This is indicative of a return rate of just an additional 500 kilograms per hour. So it's scalable. But that's just the energy saving. And typically, when we want to factor in the cost savings associated with minimizing the raw water and minimizing the chemicals that we then need to add to that water, then typically the energy, typically the cost savings overall mean that it's going to be doubled, a significant cost saving there. But 
do you remember we'd mentioned that a good benchmark for holding the feed water in storage is around about 85 degrees. And that cannot be improved on with a traditional vented deaerator or a traditional hot well. Uh, and that's because of that risk of cavitation that we've spoke about. But more advanced processes are now keeping the feed water under pressures of around about 0.2 bar gauge, which, which means we can elevate the temperature of the water to somewhere around 105 degrees. So that's going to bring us a number of benefits. First of all, if it's pressurized, we can contain those flash steam losses. We get an energy efficiency benefit. Higher temperature it means the boiler is going to respond more rapidly. Higher temperature, it means we need to put less energy into the water to produce steam. But I suppose one of the key benefits here is we need to add fewer chemicals into the, into the water because it's purged off the air and other non-condensables by pressure. And if we're adding fewer chemicals into the feed water, we need to perform less blowdown. We get a consistently better quality of condensate and therefore a better condition of the steam. We get less overall corrosion of the network. But on the subject of condensate contamination, a lot of end users are still dumping condensate to waste for fear of it being contaminated by the process. So they're missing the opportunity to recover the heat from that condensate. And the good news is uh, that we could use a contamination control device to determine when it's at an incorrect pH or it's got a, an incorrect particulate level. We could use conductivity probes or turbidity probes to divert contaminated condensate to waste, but crucially, recover as much of the hot water as we possibly can when it's in a good condition for us to do so. So I just want to finish on this particular slide, and it's one that we've gone through previously. And if we're metering different inputs in the energy center, for example, the raw water that's being consumed, the fuel that's being consumed, the steam that's going out to the plant, and the water that's traveling from the feed tank to the boiler, well, we can make sense of these inputs from an energy monitor, for example, if we've identified that our steam output is stable and the water that we're consuming from the feed tank is stable, but over a period of weeks, we're consuming significantly more water and fuel, it tells us straight away that we've got a problem. We're consuming more raw water. We need to heat that water. And that's probably down to, down to the fact that we're not recovering anywhere near as much condensate as we could. And once we know that, we can calculate that inefficiency in financial terms and we can identify what's gone wrong. Have those pumps failed? Have we got steam traps that have failed in the open position? Have we got excessive volumes of flash steam being vented away? All of which we can address to ensure that we get an increased rate of condensate and optimize the network. So there's a lot to go through there. Uh, hopefully you found it of, uh, of use for you. Yeah? I've put some points up there just to just to summarize the, the, the salient issues that we need to give thought to whenever we're talking about condensate systems. Uh, hopefully you found that of interest. Just to remind you that we do have um, a further three topics to cover off in the coming weeks. You'll notice that we've put the eighth topic, STEAM, what the future holds, um, to, to run uh, alongside the, the topics that we had originally diarised. If you do have any additional training requirements, we do have a dedicated training centre. We can go into the STEAM and condensate loop in, in far, far more detail than I've covered off in these presentations. However, please don't hesitate to email me directly, message me on LinkedIn, if you do have any questions, I will follow up with a PDF of the slide pack and I will arrange for a CPD certificate if it's required, if you'd like to get in touch with me directly. But on that note, I'd like to thank you for uh, dialing in and attending tonight's presentation. Um, and Brian, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly address them. Okay, thanks, Dan, as, as usual, uh, top-notch job. Um, presenting the lecture. We've got a couple of questions that have come through the chat. Uh, 
I'll take them uh, as they arrived. Uh, just bear with let me make sure I get the first one first. Yeah, uh, as the condon said, line is at a lower temperature and pressure than the steam line. Can the piping design temperature pressure be lower than the steam line? If so, where should the design condition break point be? Over the steam trap, question mark. Uh, yes, essentially, it can be at a lower pre it can be at a lower pressure, and therefore the pipe work should be designed uh, can be designed at a lower pressure. Um, good working practice is um, if you're distributing steam in shed 80 pipe work, for example, yeah, it's acceptable to step down to shed 40 with uh, with, with condensate. Um, we wouldn't encourage you to recover condensate in copper pipe work. Um, because some of the chemicals can leach out of the copper and find its way entrained within the condensate, which can cause problems in the boiler, um, cause conductivity problems, uh, for example. Uh, but uh, the, the pressure break should be considered uh, downstream of the steam trap. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, next one up is uh, what is water hammer? Water hammer is essentially water in the form of condensate typically arising as a result of wet steam that exists in a network that has been designed to accommodate vapor such as steam so when we're conveying steam we've got those gentle sweeping bends um, imagine a slug of water steam and condensate they move at different velocities if we've got a high pressure steam it's pushing the condensate at a very very high speed we're moving the steam at 40 meters per second, 70 miles an hour. Kilogram of condensate in a pipe work moving at 70 miles an hour. It's going to rip the guts out of any control valve and create a lot of damage and noise with anything that, that gets in the path of that mastered condensate. Excellent, thanks Dan. Next one is, do condensate pipelines fall under the pressure regs as they are not solely water? Uh, good question. Um, some would argue yes, some would argue no. I suppose it depends whether it's pressurised condensate or whether it's vented condensate. Um, if it's condensate that is under pressure, not draining to gravity, um, yeah, it's probably going to fall under PSSR. Mm. Okay, so question mark over that. Um, I think it'll depend whether or not it's classed as having a uh, the correct uh, fluid in the, in the system uh, would be one telling point. Um, I had one request for the YouTube channel address. I'll be able to send that to everybody uh, on the call via the message in a minute. Um, next one, bear with us. Uh, regards your answer to piping design conditions, what about the risk of stream trap failing? Uh, being stuck open, does this have to be considered? If a steam trap fails open, then we're going to get plant steam that is essentially conveyed in the condensate line and it will get vented away at some point. Typically, it's going to be at the flash steam vent that sits on top of the condensate receiver uh, or that flash steam, could, oh, sorry, that plant steam as a result of the failed steam trap could be conveyed all the way back to the boiler house, at which point it will exit the vent that sits on top of the of the hot well. Not ideal, um, but providing we've sized the condensate pipe work correctly, we're not going to get a significant overpressure. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, I'm just going to send a link round. Uh, hopefully that'll work. If anybody wants to see any of the previous videos, should be in the chat now. Um, no more questions. Okay. So if anybody does want to contact me on LinkedIn or on uh, the email address, you can say I'll gladly I'll gladly take any more or any more questions um, after the event. Uh, and if you do require a PDF or a certificate, please get in touch. Okay. Thanks, Dan. As always, great. Uh, just a couple of thank yous as well. Nikki Baxter, who uh, is with the IMECE, she helps the Yorkshire region. And if anybody wants to get involved with the Yorkshire region IMEC -E, just hunt me down on LinkedIn. Um, we predominantly do things through uh, volunteers like myself. Uh, so if you want to volunteer, 
uh, get stuck in it's uh, it's good fun uh, also uh, thank you to Sparrick Sarko who uh, support Dan doing this and a thank you to Project Solutions Limited who uh, hosting these events uh, Dan uh, pointed out that we've got uh, eight lectures now the last one is the future of steam and the, the scheduled um, it's every fortnight now isn't it Dan it is yeah so uh, hopefully I'll see all you guys uh, next. Uh, we're talking about steam quality on the 10th of February. Um, hopefully see everybody. Have a nice evening. Cheers, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys.